What's up you guys and welcome back to another reddit reading video. We're going to be doing another r slash melissa compliance video. We have gotten a nice little string of these videos and I am loving it. I think it was yesterday's video, I commented on someone else's comment and was like, these videos are just so satisfying. It feels like they are just handcrafted to be so beautiful. Ah, this just in. Mr. Edit Reading here, um, Reddit Reading's editor. Today we're going to be trying a little bit different of a video, we're going to try doing it without any of the words popping up. And let's see if you guys like this, if you guys like this, tell me down below, if you don't, if you want me to go back to putting up all the words, let me know so we can, you know, figure this out as Mr. Edit Readings, so I can know what to do for Mr. Reddit Reading's videos. Thank you so much, and let's get on to the video. Let's go ahead and get on to the story with you specified the law, Mr. Lawyer. Back in 2014, I was a support analysis for a company that made and hosted medical screening applications and healthcare registries. One of the registries for the medical implants and covered England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It was one of the largest of its kind in the world and as such received a data request from organizations and government agencies from all over the world. One of my pet peeves was people mentioning the Freedom of Information Act FOI, repeatedly as if we'd never heard of it. And they put in the subject line of any attachments and a few in the email, you didn't actually need to quote the FOI. Just ask the dang question and we'll process it for you. Annoying, but nothing major. Then one day, I got an email that sent off the inner jerk in me. The email's from a lawyer in Indenburg, and he had done the same thing, but with a slight difference. He quoted repeatedly the Freedom of Information Scotland Act. It was mentioned at least six or seven times in the email, plus the subject line, comprising about 40% of the total text or so it seemed. The whole email was rather blunt, demanding, a touch patronizing, and ended with a threat of legal action if we didn't comply. Completely unnecessary, and I couldn't just let it go. I did some research to check my understanding and confirm my suspicions. He very specifically and repeatedly quoted the FOIs, and he is a lawyer, so he should know the law, right? I sent him an email acknowledging the receipt and did nothing for 28 days. On day 28, I sent another email advising the Medical Implant Registry of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland does not operate in Scotland, and therefore we don't retain or process any of the data that falls under the FOIs. I ended it by saying if he'd like to resubmit his request under FOI, we'd be happy to process it within 28 day limit. Update, to add a little context, all the data slash statistics that we provided was just adjusted from the surgeon slash hospital because even the best implant can fail if the surgeon does a bad job. The way he phrased the request, it could easily be interpreted that he only wanted the data that falls under the Scottish FOI, i.e. from Scottish hospitals, as he opened it with a threat. I chose that interpretation and made him wait the maximum time to tell him. If he hadn't done that, I would have called or emailed to clarify his needs. Some paralegal from his office resubmitted a request about a week later. It was much narrow in scope and politely written. It was processed in about a week. Well, that's a good reminder to be kind to people. You don't always have to be so mean and forceful. And working in customer service in the past, like I used to have to work with customers, Working with people can sometimes just like get on your nerves because some people are just so rude thinking being rude will get your way. Even though like I worked somewhere where if like any one tiny little letter or number or anything was off, I could just immediately deny and like not give them their service. It was with money. Also checking IDs, if it was like anything smudged, if any of the plastic was ripped off, if there was one, you know, if they didn't have the middle name, if the birthday wasn't right, anything, if they were like super mean, I would just be like, no, I can't do it, I'm sorry, I would follow the policy to a T, but like normal people and nice people, like those small things, ah, uh, come on, you let that pass. But for the extremely rude people, oh, I am I'm extremely sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. But we are unable to take damaged identification cards. If you have another ID, I'd be happy to take that one. And they would just be going crazy. <laughs> that's kind of my that's kind of my little malicious compliance. I would comply with a handbook a little bit too good. <laughs> All right, on to the next story. This is just one big paragraph. My dad, honestly, I've been looking at her for a bit. Enjoy reading these posts of various people's malicious compliance. When I saw a few posts that suddenly reminded me of a story my dad told me back when I was about eight or nine. My dad has always been the kind person that does exactly what you told him to. Malicious compliance, of course, as well as pretty funny, all out friendly guy. So the story is probably set around 1987, something like that, when he's eating dinner with his mom, dad, sister, and quite possibly his older half sister as well. His sister, my aunt Sarah, was causing problems at the dinner table. Being rude and cheeky, but my dad started up as well. The mouthy little poop that he is. Anyways, my grandma was already dealing with Sarah and she did not want to have to deal with him as well. So she bluntly and quite frankly told him get your butt in the room. Of course, when he was told this, he immediately goes into his room like requested 
but instead of going in the room, my dad just stuck his butt in the doorway of the room and called down smartly. I've got my butt in my room. You only said my butt, so just my butt's in my room. Needless to say, his mom was not happy with that, and he got in trouble. But I say it was well worth it, don't you? P.S. This kind of stuff that my dad continues to pull, even to this day, much to my mom's targeting. But my siblings and I quite enjoy it. Ah, the old, I will take this 100% literally. My wife loves to do this. <laughs> That's good. That's something I would do when I was a kid. I was, a, I was an annoying little kid. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> On to the very next story. Sure, let's ruin this expensive electrical equipment completely unnecessarily. This is a story that my friend John told me. John works for a utilities company that has a contract to install energy meters in domestic households across the country. His division covers an area with a population of about 2 million people. Every morning, he looks at his little company iPad to see if the list of his jobs has gone off in his van to remove the old meters and install the new ones. The company has a very ambitious target for all households in the country to have all these new meters by a certain date. As it goes with companies that do this kind of work, they regularly get audited. The employees' vans get checked for safety, the meters and equipment get doubled and triple checked and so on. That fateful day was an internal audit for that local. It was a beautiful April morning when the engineers covering John's area turned up to have their vans and equipment inspected. There were many people in vans and John had to wait a while for their internal auditor, Mark, to approach. He pronounced that Mark left a trail of puzzled faces in his wake. Alright mate, Mark said, can you just unload the meters from your van and put them on the ground in front? John said, looking at the April sky. Really, I mean, it looks like it's going to rain. Nah, it'll be fine. No, really, the forecast this morning said that there was going to be rain. And also, the sky's looking a bit cloudy. Look, Mark snapped, I have loads of these tests while you guys are indoors being quizzed. Just do as I say and leave them on the ground. As you move to the next guy, John made incredulous eye contact with another engineer, and they both shrugged as they started unloading the meters. Sure enough, as they sat in the conference room doing their knowledge and aptitude test, it started pouring, like really coming down. A few minutes later, Mark ran in, grabbed one guy, and they went outside. John is not only a responsible person in general, but also happens to like his job, so he spoke up. Shouldn't we all go out there and help? The manager in charge of the test says, tersely, Mark only got that one guy. John shrugged. Alright. After they finished what they were doing, they went back outside. The hundreds of electrical meters were still on the ground, and Mark was still running around, looking a little nervous. John called him over. Mate, what are you doing? None of these are usable now. No, no, Mark said. See, the ones that you put upside down will still be fine. A few other engineers came over and stared. Mark, John said, taking him by the shoulders. These are all electrical meters. They are not waterproof. Literally, none of them are usable now. Compliance would kick our butt if we even thought about putting them in the customer's home. You do realize, another engineer said, that because you insisted we dump our stuff into the rain, no one in this area of 2 million people will have a meter to fit in at least the next 3 days? As Mark looked around him, the reality of what he'd done dawned on him. John later described the color of his face to me as just pure gray. Six months after John first told me this story, I asked him what happened to Mark. He said no one had heard from him again. Edit, someone brought up this comment so I thought I'd add it to the main post. John and the other guys aren't engineers in the technical sense. They don't have engineering degrees and they don't do any technical planning. However, their job title is meter engineer and so I refer to them as such out of familiarity. Hope that clears things up. Well, Mark is a jerk. Mark probably, he probably got fired, boom, on the spot. He might have like called up his boss, confessed and got fired, or went on the run after he damaged everyone's stuff from 2 million people. <laughs> I might just run away too and cower. That sucks, but hey, that shows you not to be a jerk and listen to people's good advice. Sometimes other people's advice can help. Some people who are really strong-willed have a hard time understanding that other people's input sometimes can be helpful and that you don't just always know best, you know? Anyways, I really hope you guys enjoyed this r slash Melissa's Compliance video. It probably is a little bit shorter since I've only been recording for 15 minutes. <laughs> Usually I'm recording for 40 minutes, so this is probably gonna be cut down really small. Ah uh, yes, Mr. Edit Reading again. One more little commercial break. Let me know once again, do you like it with these little relaxing images in the background with just the title? Or do you want the words to keep popping up with, uh, you know, every paragraph that comes up? Let me know down below so I can pick the best option for you guys and your viewing pleasure. Thanks again and goodbye. Back to your, uh, Mr. Red Reading or whatever his name is. Wait a minute, where was I? <laughs> this is literally like an hour later. I started playing with my dog out of nowhere. I think this is the end of the video, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you guys have any suggestions for a subject you want me to cover, just let me know down below. I always take <coughs> excuse me suggestions. I hope I see you guys next time, and goodbye. My lovely.